Okay, we can start. Very good, thank you. And welcome everybody tonight to this special council meeting for the municipality of West Perth. Uh, the main purpose of this meeting tonight is to go over a presentation with regards to work that's been done on a proposed future um, administration building. So um, we will call this meeting to order. And the first item that we probably should do is confirm the agenda that was uh, sent out, uh, I believe, on the weekend. So do we have a mover and seconder for that? Uh, Councillor Harold, Councillor Marshall, thank you. All those in favor? That is carried. Thanks. Does anybody have a conflict of interest with the agenda as it was sent out? Okay, we will carry on. So it brings us down to the main portion of the meeting, uh, presentation of, uh, of work that's been done. And I believe uh, Nelson Dolly is going to... Uh, I'll give you introduction. Okay, so Jeff's going to uh, start off and then we'll go into the engineer and the architect. So Jeff, you can take it away. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much. I, I will uh, note... Jeff, we can't hear you. Mayor's on mute. There we go. Yeah, the mayor has control of this. <laughs> yeah, I just forgot. We have the whole room on one. one. So thank you for waving everyone. That was a very effective strategy and it worked. Um, so uh, thanks everyone. Um, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to provide an update of the work of the building working group and, um, and present uh, the uh, make a presentation, which will essentially be the same presentation which will be made tomorrow night at the um, public open houses that are done in person, and then on Wednesday on the virtual open house. And just as a, a very brief uh, introductory before we go into this, um, we're going to try to say discipline to our time um when we start the presentation because this is an opportunity for, for us to time check it i will mention to council that this afternoon we got the final changes to the presentation for council made and the uh, presentation that i'm making right now was added to the agenda and your agenda was reposted this afternoon we have with us um john rutledge and nelson dolly who are also going to present tonight and i would be remiss if i didn't mention that the building working group is Walter McKenzie, Doug Eit, Dean Trentowski, Steve Harold, and supported by myself, Darcy Cook, and Bob McLean. And we have all those folks on the call. We also have interim treasurer uh, Terry Rao um, on the call tonight in case there's any financial questions. And of course, Levitza is assisting us with running the meeting, and Kristen as well. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to drop through this slide deck, which um, is the base that we'll be working from tomorrow night. So everyone can see the slide deck, the header slide for today's council meeting. Good. So uh, I want to first of all provide an outline of the work that has been completed by the building committee. It's essentially the presentation we'll use tomorrow night and Wednesday night. We're going to uh, we are sharing this with council in advance of the uh, open houses and to allow council the opportunity to provide feedback. Um, and if there's anything that we need to change or if we find any um, errors in the slides, we certainly can change them for tomorrow evening. And uh, the presentation comes in three chunks. There's going to be project background, which I will cover. And then the conceptual designs, I will talk about the driving principles, but then we'll hand it over to Nelson and John to speak about the various uh, designs. And then it'll come back to me at the end to cover the preliminary budget and financing. So I want to just start out with a little bit of a brief uh, couple of slides about the sort of history of, of town <coughs> administration offices for, for Mitchell. Um, and, and of course, West Perth is here now, but the old Mitchell Town Hall was located on St. George Street, sort of across from Black Talis, or what used to be Parmalat or Stacy Brothers. Um, it was demolished in 1959, and the bell was removed, and is we have that bell in storage. It was it spent a long time in Centennial Park, and then when we redeveloped Centennial Park, it was again put back in storage, and we do have that bell, which we'll want to use for a meaningful project at some time. 
the tower was to be preserved as well, and you can see it was quite a striking tower. And uh, but the crane failed while it was being dismantled and it was destroyed. So if you refer to the picture of Mitchell uh, book that Dean Robinson put together, photos from 1857 to 1997, mm -hmm. photos and stories, these uh, pictures are in that book showing um, the, uh, the dismantling and everything was under control and then all of a sudden it wasn't. So um, unfortunately that um, cupola style uh, bell tower was lost but uh, we do have the bell that was in it. It was taken out before the bell was, uh, tower was destroyed. Now, um, I mentioned that because um, the, the history of town hall offices is obviously a very important thing. And in West Perth, I think we really care about celebrating our history and, and uh, we have uh, a quite, a, quite, a, quite an interesting uh, history to fall back on. The current uh, administration office for the uh, municipality of West Perth is the building that uh, a few of us are in tonight for the council meeting and normally where we would be meeting as council. Uh, it was uh, originally constructed as a, a high school in 1924 and it was used as a high school until 1957. I actually got a little education on that today that it's uh, uh, believed that it was kind of that the both sites were used for 1957 and 1958 even but uh, eventually it became the town um, today we use it for the West Perth offices for the amalgamated West Perth but eventually it became the town of Mitchell um, administration office in 1959 or 1960. So this is a shot of the building a more a more contemporary shot uh, the town of Mitchell uh, completed renovations and began using the uh, former high school as uh, town offices in 1959 or 1960. Uh, there was additional renovations completed in 1983 and 1988, fairly substantial uh, renovations. And uh, the building is not designated as a historical building, although I would point out um, that there is a, an interesting architectural feature on the building, which you can see on the previous slide. And I'll just roll back to it for a second, where it says Mitchell Town Hall was a, a, a concrete backbone that is then a bricked parapet. And uh, in about 2003, that brick parapet, 2002, that brick parapet was in uh, a state of disrepair and the decision was made to cover it with steel. And you could see when you look at the building as it looks today, it's covered in, in, a, in a brown steel that matches in very nicely. That parapet is under there, but um, we have no idea what shape it is in, but I think we can only speculate it would be in pretty rough shape. Um, and you can see at the time this photo was taken that the building actually was also used for West Perth Power Inc. is the wording on the side of the building. It was used as the administration offices for West Perth Power at a time. So the current building, just to talk about condition assessment for a moment, there was a detailed building condition assessment completed on many West Perth assets in 2012. And this current administration office was included in that process. And the 2012 process culminated in a number of recommendations um, around equipment depots um, and things like that, which we've acted on many of those recommendations. Um, for the municipal office, the, uh, the 2012 condition assessment identified some significant issues. And um, the slide that's shown on this, uh, on this particular slide, the slide within a slide is a slide that was in a presentation that was made on January 29th, 2013. Um, it was a, the culmination of a process looking at the municipal office and it included a recommendation that um, the, uh, there were it identified a number of issues with accessibility, identified code compliance issues that actually had the wrong date of construction because we were only able to confirm that recently. And um, they did that building condition assessment identified $1.1 million of works that would be required over the following 10 years and $2.3 million over the next uh, um, 25 years. This process led to a recommendation that the municipality 
uh, design a 14,005 square foot. I'm not sure where the five came from, but that's the number that came from the process, a 14,000 square, five square foot new municipal office. And obviously that was not acted on because we're still in the old office today in 2021. We updated the building condition assessment uh, work that was completed in 2012 with a project that started in 2017 uh, and was completed in 2018. That work focused on electrical, mechanical, and structural uh, and individual reports with very detailed analysis by engineering firms. And it was also, it also included an accessibility report. This work was done by Wilson Diaz Architecture out of London. Uh, they, we procured that project and they delivered uh, this information as a part of that. It identified that many of the building systems were well past their design life, which wasn't a surprise. And for example, the pot boilers are the pot boilers that were put in in 1983 as a part of that section, second major renovation of this building. And, um, and frankly, over the last eight years, we've been reluctant to uh, make major uh, upgrades to the building because the recommendation has been sitting there that we should build new. And there's the fear that we spend good money after bad on a building that we really were intending to abandon. Um, but we've also been lucky that we haven't had any major system failures. So um, accessibility was another report um, that was prepared by Wilson Diaz and it identifies several major issues. Um, and I, I need to point out that buildings in accordance with the uh, uh, accessibility for with uh, Ontarians with Disabilities Act, the AODA, that all, all public buildings in Ontario are to be compliant with accessibility standards by 2025. And this approaching 2025 deadline is uh, one, of the, um, one of the urgencies that's pushing the decision that we need to make a decision and decide we've, uh, we've not made a decision and we've been lucky there hasn't been a major systems failure, but this uh, 2025 date is approaching and we need to be prepared for it. And um, the slide shows a number of things. The exterior ramps are non-compliant. They're one to eight and they should be one to 12 or even one to 15. There's stairs, the typical door frame, and we just chose one door to show a picture of here. They're all narrower than they're supposed to be. And you can imagine the, the amount of intervention needed to widen those doors to the uh, accessibility standard. And of course, that door that's shown in the top right is the door that is uh, got a set of stairs on the other side of it that you see in the bottom right. And uh, so uh, the stairs are problematic. The design of the front desk, uh, service desk is problematic. And this picture of the main hallway, which is nine feet wide and takes a lot of uh, unused space and has stairways up to the washrooms are all examples of significant accessibility uh, constraints. So uh, just to summarize the current building, the, the uh, detailed building condition assessments have identified significant and costly repairs required to major systems. There's major retrofits needed for accessibility and that 2000 and 13 or 12 process led to a recommendation in 2013 that we should build new. And uh, given that 2013 recommendation and given the building code requirements related to accessibility compliance, investments in the building have been limited since 2013. And what the building code complication is, is that if we were to begin to address accessibility in the building, that required a building permit, we would be obligated to make the building fully accessible. So under the requirements of the code, you can't incrementally make these improvements. You would have to, to obtain a building permit to make all of the improvements in one shot. So needless to say, uh, the, there was reluctance to uh, take on accessibility that would require a building code permit because it would head you down the path of a full renovation 
And again, the 2013 recommendation was to, to build new rather than, than renovate. And we've arrived at this point. And so the bottom line in the current building is that it was, uh, it was purpose built as a high school and used from 1924 to 1957 for that purpose. And then after that time, the structural design elements limit the optimization of space for an office. So there are some elements in this building like the concrete spine that runs down the middle of it that causes the large hallways that are very good for a high school but very dysfunctional for a municipal office. And those are just the limitations with trying to use something for a purpose that it wasn't built for, but we have made do for many years. Now, options to move forward. So council had a special meet meeting on December 3rd, 2020 to review options and three options were considered. The do nothing option and this option doesn't address the non-conforming accessibility to do nothing would not address the risk of major systems failures or functional needs of the municipality. And one of those functional needs is that we really could use a larger council chambers for anyone who's come here on a night where we have two or three public meetings and we have people standing in the hall at the top of stairs, which isn't a good plan to begin with. Um, we really could use a larger council space to undertake the governance of the organization. The second option that was put before council on December 3rd was the option of renovating the current office to address all deficiencies. And the estimate provided in 2018, so this is 2018 dollars by Wilson Diaz was $4.36 million to renovate 12,000 square feet of usable space. And then finally, the third option we put before council on December 3rd was a build new administration office option. The 2020 estimate that we created for that on the basis of some uh, input from Dolly Engineering and on the basis of some preliminary concept work to get 14,000 square feet for a new build was 3.43 million. And I would note that that comes on the heels of the fire hall project which basically provides a significant amount of the civil works needed. Uh, they're there if we need them. We don't have to hook into them, but they are there stubbed in in the event that we ever chose to build a new office. And that price is uh, held down significantly by not having those civil works needing to be added new. So on council's um, decision, on December 3rd was to proceed with the new build option. Council also directed staff to apply for a grant opportunity, which did bring this to a head because it was a deadline of December 21st. And that's why we moved quick and brought that December 3rd special meeting uh, forward to council. Council also, also authorized a single source procurement for conceptual design and other services related to a new building in the increments of which we would take them if we move forward. And finally, council affirmed the membership of the uh, council members that were on the project committee, which is now we're calling the project working group. And it was the same group that steered the uh, fire hall project from uh, early concepts through to completion. So the current status is the building working group has met four times. The building working group has reviewed the proposal from Dolly Engineering for design services that included the services of John Rutledge, architect, and you'll meet John when he speaks later in this presentation. And it also included the services of other uh, engineering professionals in areas such as electrical and mechanical. The building work, working group recommended to council that uh, contract and that, and council did authorize the signing of that contract. Um, the building working group has also worked to review functional needs and conceptual floor plans. They have reviewed building profile options. So what will the building look like from the street? Um, what's the amount of space we need was considered what would be a proper amount of space that would give us some, some opportunity for growth, for example. Building working group has worked through that in the four meetings that they've had. They've reviewed a project budget estimate and project financing options. And the building working group uh, insisted that we find a meaningful way to, or meaningful opportunity for the public to have input. 
And so this is the first of a series of meetings this week where we're presenting to council. And then tomorrow night, there are two in-person open houses that are being managed for COVID um, awareness and COVID safety tomorrow evening at five and tomorrow evening at seven. And then on Wednesday, we're going to offer a virtual office option for anyone that's not would prefer virtual. Now that we've been doing virtual, some people prefer it or would uh, only be able to attend that way. So that's Wednesday evening. So uh, before we move ahead, um, so we've got the public open houses scheduled. The next steps for council would be um, to consider the input they receive. Council would need to approve conceptual designs and preliminary cost estimates and authorize the project proceed to detailed design. So at this point in time, the only part of the budget that's been expended is the preliminary design part. Uh, to move to detailed tender ready drawings is another increment of expenditure which Council would need to approve. Council would then, uh, when those drawings come back, need to approve the project going to tender and we would tender using our typical method, the same method we used for the fire hall, where we uh, sought bids through bids and tenders and had, I believe it was 12 uh, competitive bids. And then finally, council would review those tendered prices, which is the way you find out what the real price will be versus the estimated price. And council would need to make a decision at that time about whether they wanted to proceed with entering into the contract and doing the project. So there are still council approval steps involved. And this is uh, one of the uh, ones that has to be done before we can move forward. On the topic of the conceptual designs, uh, our process is being guided by a number of uh, key principles. And I would just highlight a few of them. A focus on accessibility and with the building that we currently having, have being so inaccessible and knowing where the government wants to steer us it's the only responsible thing to do. We really were driving for a practical, modest and functional design that provides excellent value for the residents of West Perth. We want um, a public space at the front and a secure office area, which is one of the lessons learned from COVID. We want uh, council chambers that can accommodate a large meeting. We wanna consider other elements of pandemic readiness such as you know, a design that allows for uh, wider hallways and workspaces that can be isolated were we to get into another pandemic. It can't completely dominate the design, but I think we want to be aware of it. And certainly for air handling, um, it's a consideration. We wanna consider energy efficiency, the ease of maintenance and natural light, which are all good design considerations of the building given its location next to the fire hall because they, the, the space to build it would be fronting on Wellington Street uh, to the south of the fire hall and uh, we want to consider parking um, and those kind of how we use the space we want to have an opportunity for some additional space for growth sort of short medium and long-term growth needs and we don't want to sort of overbuild and have large areas not used for a long time but we also want to be smart about how we can convert into space as we move forward. And we want to consider options for celebrating our history, such as the bell. And I'm going to turn it over at this point in time to uh, Nelson Dolly to speak about the design features in the floor plan. And I'll stop this share and uh, um, then um, Nelson can share his screen and uh, John can speak to it, the uh, um, profile documents. So what I've shared is I'm starting with the floor plan and I'm looking down in the corner to make sure I unmuted myself. The, uh, the floor plan is 14,000 square feet the fire hall is actually along this side, which you'll see in the floor plan in the next uh, page. We zoom into the main entrance. Uh, the main entrance is underneath a canopy. And then we would come into a lobby. And uh, the community room for use on the right hand side, there's a little uh, uh, 
uh, kitchenette, fridge, uh, no stove, but a microwave, and then storage as well for the uh, community room. On the far side, as you come through the lobby and the display cases, uh, there'd be the council chambers. In this council chambers, this table that you see here is actually uh, the council table that you currently have put together with a small section added. So that is what's shown here for size. There will be a, a partition that's a folding that would allow this area to be used for multi-use. And so the community room can easily seat and handle, you know, 40 to 60 people, whereas this space over here could easily handle up to 100 people and, and more depending on how, how tight it gets stacked in. And behind the council chambers, there's a meeting room that can be used by all of staff, but during a council uh, meeting, it provides a breakout room to come back in to go in camera off the back of the uh, council chamber. A little workstation in the corner, so it can also be used as an additional work area if needed. <clears throat> we have the storage along this side <clears throat> so that uh, chairs could be moved or tables fold out if this for this multi-use space. Okay. Okay, so we're getting feedback. It's here. Can you mute, please, Walter? Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. So as you come in through the lobby, the customer service is front center as we come in. A couple of small waiting areas. Uh, there'll be a little divide here for privacy. And we have lots of space in here again, from a pandemic uh, situation where we can come in and use counters and still have, uh, well, currently the six feet or eight feet that you want between people. This counter here would be set for barrier-free accessibility. This counter and the building department counter would be set at a little higher, uh, 42 inches high bank of washrooms here for the public. One would be your universal washroom, which again provides all the barrier free requirements and then two additional washrooms. So if this community room is being rented out, there's where we would be locked off and that community room would have access to this front space and the washrooms out front. <clears throat> um, we have a consult room here, so the public can come into here and staff can go in and meet with them privately into a small uh, consult room. This room, we have mechanical, but this room here where I've identified as meeting and storage or meeting office, it will be set up that it can be an office, can be a small meeting room, uh, could become the mayor's office, could be, uh, deputy mayor and mayor. So it's, it is, has an ability to change its function as the municipality needs that change to happen. The building department we've kept all together on the one side, close to the building department's uh, counter. You'll notice that we have the consult room dividing customer service and the building department. So any noise overflow helps dampen it through this through the front area. Uh, in behind the uh, building and men, finance, legislative and customer service. And this, this particular counter would be rotating. Uh, different uh, staff would work there as needed. We have a storage vault, which has uh, just over a thousand feet of filing length. So these are sliding um, uh, cabinets or sliding uh, file storage. We have a, an entrance here partway down the building as you will, as uh, 
we had the main entrance out front, but we have a, an entrance here partway down the building for fire exit reasons, but as well to provide a separate entrance for the building department so they can wash and hose off their boots and they're not walking through the entire office. The main employee entrance would be at the rear of the building off of the parking lot. The financial analysts, treasurer, tax revenue are all kept in one pod together. And across from that pod, there's two future offices and we have a space for a planner, which currently or, or would become uh, maybe once a week, twice a week, or at some point in time, full time. We have a print copy room that attaches to storage so that we can get to that print copy room from either side of the building for flow for the staff. And this electrical room in the center of the building also will provide the IT room. <clears throat> Clerk and council service are along this side of the building away from uh, building department. And then as well, we have two future managers office with the CAO uh, in the uh, back corner. The uh, lunch and meeting and training area here so it can be a lunch room but it also can be used as a training or a meeting room the the canopy walkway along this side provides us covered protection back to rear parking and as you see on the next page when we're looking at the site plan we don't have a lot of parking out front we wanted to keep this building very close to the same line as the fire hall. And then we will maintain this parking that was here existing. We'll modify it a bit and maybe add some additional parking in here. This is a very rough draft of potential parking and, and site plan. And uh, there has to be further development and discussion on, on this. The fire hall parking, that's all existing. And this shaded area shows the area that could be future development and not that space not required by either fire hall or proposed municipal office at this point in time. So there is parking back here. They can walk underneath the canopy and be protected and come to the front. The, there is potential for filling in this corner in the future for expansion or coming off the back of this building straight out uh, for future expansion. So those were, will be the areas that you would look at for any kind of uh, for future expansion. Uh, not showing on this really and uh, was a servicing, but we brought in servicing between these two buildings. And there's a transformer situated in this area here. From that transformer, we will have to feed this building temporarily, well, or permanent, um, to remove an existing service that comes underneath this building here. Now, as well, when we are doing the site, site plan finalizing, we will be identifying some of the parking spaces for uh, electric charging and that type of thing as well. And now I'm going to flip into the uh, to the different options of elevations and perspectives that we had. Um, John, I'll let you take it over as far as discussing of these elevations and just let me know when uh, you want me to flip to the next slide. Christian, if you can unmute John. Yeah, so all I can do is ask him to unmute. So I've done that. Okay, John, so in the bottom left corner where there's a mic, you just have to click on it. Okay. Do you want to go? Oh, uh, the video. The video. Oh, no, I'm too. Yeah. Following the down the bit. Just the 14th of January 2016. Okay, sorry about that. 
Um, for those of you who do not, have not met me yet, my name is John Rutledge. I'm originally from Brussels, so not too far away. But my grandmother, Grace Klein and Will Klein, uh, they lived in Mitchell. Uh, they used to grow glads at the back of the cemetery. And my mom is from Staffa and Cromarty area. So I don't feel that I'm a stranger in West Perth, and it's certainly an honor to work on this building on that. Um, the exterior designs that we came up uh, principally for the front of the building, um, the first option, we tried to do some very reasonable architectural designs, uh, nothing too outlandish and nothing too plain, somewhere in the middle, uh, something reasonable. So proposal A, uh, you'll see the east front exterior elevation, and it's a mix between contemporary styles and traditional styles. And it could be done in stone veneer, or it could be clad in brick veneer. Okay, next, Nelson. Um, this is uh, an exterior view of the building, a very schematic conceptual view, um, but it, um, shows the building uh, quite nicely. It also shows the, the really neat wraparound porch that uh, is entering the building. And also the, the wraparound porch will facilitate a nice garden between the, the new office and the, the fire hall, which I think will be a nice feature to the building. Uh, okay. Um, this proposal is a little more contemporary in nature, um, although the buildings are the windows are a little more traditional. So again, it's a balance between um, some little bit traditional but more contemporary, a uh, little more informal um, in design. The uh, building, this proposal is stead, clad with stone veneer. And then where the West Perth Municipal Office sign is, uh, that's with diamond steel panels, which are made in Wingham. Uh, okay. Uh, again, the uh, pictorial view uh, of the building uh, gives a clearer picture of, of how the roof um, works on the building um, on that and how it, it's viewed um, if you're standing in front of the fire hall. Okay. Um, this proposal uh, is a little more residential in nature. Um, so we thought we'd sort of tone it down. This also makes the building look a little, look smaller uh, on that. Uh, again, could be done in stone veneer, could also be done in brick. Um, also uh, with um, some fairly sizable windows, okay? Now the, uh, the pictorial of this one, Proposal C, um, shows you how much smaller the building actually looks with a big hip roof or a cottage roof. Um, some people will call them a pyramid roof, but the actual technical term is a hip roof. And hip roofs always make buildings look smaller. Okay. Now, this one um, is uh, a little more daring and it's a mix between Italianate Second Empire historic architectural styles. Uh, the central part um, is similar to the central part on the Hicks House on Main Street. And then it's a contemporary version um, of the uh, Second Empire uh, with the diamond steel roofing on the two gables and on the curved tower and a uh, fairly sizable two over two windows um, um, on, on that. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different version, but I think it's worth considering. And this again shows you how the tower is in the middle of the building um, and how its shape uh, works on the front of the building. Uh, and again, this build, this one uh, would probably be better done in brick veneer as opposed to, and be a, a little bit more historic. Uh, I think that's through the proposals. Thank you. That was quick. Thank you again. <laughs> so.
So I'll just do the financial component and then we'll open it up for questions. So I'm going to share my screen, which I'm remembering how, there we go. Great. So we've, um, we've got about four or five slides here just to run through financials. So we did a budget estimate in 2020 to support the grant uh, consideration and the decision about the options that I talked about earlier. I obtained some price estimates uh, for the cost of uh, building from Dolly, uh, from Dolly Engineering and from MTE. And we came up with, um, so the design cost about $200,000, which is the Dolly and MTE based on preliminary estimate estimates. And it turned out being roughly right in around that. We had, um, we are proposing an additional amount of civil works of 115. And I would just highlight here again that there was about $600,000 of civil works went into the fire hall. And by building next to the fire hall, we're leveraging that expense that's already in the ground. If we use it, we basically save ourselves that money. If we don't use it, it had to be put in anyway. Furniture and equipment budget of 250,000, a contingency budget of 2.2% which uh, we have very few unknowns with this site. Uh, we had much more with the fire hall. We now have a lot more information and we do have uh, soil samples and uh, we know uh, we have a good sense of what we're dealing with. So that's why the low contingency and a 14,000 square foot building at $200 per square foot for a $3.43 million build for the 14,000 square feet. We um, just knowing what we're hearing from the building industry, um, we did uh, we did a, an option with higher prices for the building costs. So instead of 200 per square foot, we moved it up to 225, and that comes in at 3.78 million. Um, there are obviously supply chain issues in the market right now. Um, across many sectors and um, you know we'll only find out about this uh, real pricing when you go to market because it's uh, changed quite a bit but um, there's also some hope that things will settle down a bit but it doesn't appear to be happening anytime soon um, in terms of project financing so those are you know that range of budget that was in those two slides of 3.43 to 3.8 um, as kind of a range to look within, and that's an all-in cost, uh, assuming that those uh, construction costs don't come in even higher, that would be the all-in cost. Now, project financing. Um, we have, I mentioned earlier in the presentation that we've been reluctant to do a lot of work on this building, and uh, we've done uh, some of the work that we did, for example, council will recall when we disposed of the uh, depot, the equipment depots, a couple of them also had offices and the office portions of those sales was put into a reserve, which was set aside for a future municipal office. So we've got $1.1 million of reserves that we've got earmarked for this project. We have uh, some impending property sales that uh, are, we're working uh, to bring forward, which we're anticipating $1.1 million of revenue from those property sales. And we are showing debt financing of the balance. And I just ran this model with 3.5 million um, of $1.3 million to make up the balance. We would note that we didn't include the grant of $164,000 in this as offsetting cost. And if we were able to meet the timelines required by the current grant, and if we're successful in getting it, we would save that money. Um, and finally, uh, in we're doing analysis of our reserves and we have some general capital reserves that we could use to reduce or even potentially eliminate the debt financing option. So we left the debt financing in because it's a common practice of municipalities, but we wouldn't necessarily, it would be a council decision about whether they want to debt finance a portion of this or whether they want it to go to general capital reserves and uh, pay for it. Uh, in terms of the financial position of the municipality, uh, we currently have long-term debt of $2.5 million. It's actually uh, almost all settled. It'll be settled in 2025. And the current debt we have is uh, wastewater project debt. So water and wastewater project debt 
not uh, debt that comes from the levy. So in other words, it would be paid for off the rates that we charge for water and wastewater. We do have some upcoming long-term debt that we're taking. We're going to take some of the Henry Street uh, bridge cost in long-term debt. It needs to be said that we are collecting development charges as a portion of the development charges for residential development in West Perth that comes off and goes to pay towards the Henry Street Bridge. So that amount of that debt will be offset as we bring in development charges. We are, um, uh, we are going to be moving the West Perth, Perth Fire Hall costs to long-term debt, a 20-year debenture or a 20-year loan, I should say. And, uh, and then if we, if we did choose to go with the 1.3 million, that would make this total of three projects that we would have in new debt. And um, I would mention that in terms of what does it cost to look after debt, um, we use the uh, Infrastructure Ontario rates as they were about two or three weeks ago to come up with this model. They do move around a little bit. They've uh, been as low as 1.88% and as high as 2.7% over the last three months. Um, and they kind of do fluctuate, but uh, I believe, and Terry can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we use 2.46 or 2.7, somewhere in that range for this calculation, where um, the debt for Henry Street Bridge would be a $123,000 per year cost. Um, that's principal and interest. And of course, at the beginning, you pay more interest. And as your debt gets further mature, you pay more principal and your interest amount goes down. And so it changes over time. We haven't shown the table, but we could get it. The West Perth Fire Hall at 2.12 would be 137,000 per year. These two amounts were built into the current budget that West Perth has approved, but has not had the bylaw approved for yet. And these amounts were built in. So we've already accommodated this in our budget going forward. And then finally, the administration office, if we did choose to do the 1.3, and again, it's an option, um, it would be an additional $85,000 per year, per year. And that debt would come online at the time that we purchased it. We would certainly use construction finances, financing from Infrastructure Ontario to build it, because the current rate is 0.6%. And frankly, we can make more money by having our money in the bank. Um, then, then 0.6, and then we would just have to choose if we're going to use that reserve or whether we're going to purchase that debt at the time uh, when we want to move. We have no major water and wastewater projects planned, uh, and although it's rates, it's still something to consider in terms of the overall debt health of the municipality. And currently, we also have no major capital projects planned that would come from tax levy. So, we have, for those of you who've been following closely, um, we've done a few major projects in the last four years or five years. Uh, everything from the consolidation of the equipment depots. Um, we've done the Henry Street Bridge. Um, we're looking, we've done the fire hall and we're looking at the municipal office. This is a cycle that we're nearing the end of. Uh, these projects were planned for the last 10 to 12 years. It just happens that the cycle the way we've uh, got to these projects and built up the reserves to do them, we've done them in the last four years. So anticipating after we move through this project that we would be able to move back into a mode where we would build reserves. Uh, the reserve status for West Perth, we have approximately $26.6 million in reserves as of December 31st. Those reserves, we do have some year-end accounting to do, but that's roughly been where we've held for reserves over the last few years. These reserves are at this level despite um, uh, being on a major capital cycle and it's just that we planned ahead for some projects. The reserves are, you know, some are regulatory or ob obligatory, which means we're required to hold them and some are discretionary and we track what's uh, general taxation and what's rates related. We manage reserves to make provision for the replacement improvement of capital assets and to sustain infrastructure and meet our asset management regulatory requirements. And there are regulatory requirements to have a certain amount of uh, money in reserve, which we now have that asset management regulation and our policy in place. And in some cases, asset management recommendations. And we do use the reserves 
to sort of optimize our ability to operate as an entity. They provide us flexibility. They support our long-term financial planning. And, uh, and of course, their short-term cash flow planning and reserves help us manage. So um, West Perth implements various strategies to manage our finances. And uh, certainly with that amount of reserves, you might be asking yourself, what do we do about investments? We have a diversified investment portfolio. There are regulatory limitations to restrict risk for municipalities, but there are uh, different strategies that we can use within that portfolio, which have yielded us some pretty good returns with uh, the minimum risk as required. We've got um, our investment portfolios, consider our cash flow, capital planning, and asset management planning needs. And of course, uh, while we have not used debt as a strategy, and I don't see us get into using that is a strategy as most municipalities do. Um, we do have relatively low debt and would anticipate we would stay at a very low relative uh, debt to own source revenue uh, uh, ratio um, for municipalities of our size, we would be uh, in a very good position as far as our debt goes overall, which is a, rep which is a demonstration of good financial health. Finally, the last slide is I just want to say that um, I started this slide with a bit of uh, history and I want to mention that, you know, the summary of this is that Council has made the decision to pursue the new bill. We made that decision on December 3rd. They actually made it in 2013, but a lot's changed since then and we revisited it and came to the same conclusion. The condition of the existing building and non-compliance with accessibility are major drivers for the timing of this project. We really are running out of time to meet our compliance with AODA legislation and the consequences of not being compliant if we look back to past things is we could lose our ability to uh, to collect certain kinds of grants which would be devastating for the municipality because we've had very very good success in our grant securement and finally, um, the cost avoidance over the last number of years in terms of how we've managed this facility, this current building has allowed us to build up reserves and, um, and the time has come for us to uh, uh, move into this project. So the picture on the right is a shot off the back of the current wall and it's the bricks at the back. These are uh, names from uh, People, young young people who were uh, students at the high school, the one up at the top here is dated 1949. Um, they were written in coal because the building was heated by coal at that time. So there must be have been a uh, little flecks of coal on the ground. And there's quite a few of them across the wall. And I think that, you know, when we think about our history and think about how we move forward, if in the end of the day, we wanted to preserve this wall as a feature wall for the new office, uh, we do have opportunities where you could do it in display panels or incorporate a feature wall because this is a piece of history that, well, the building may have passed its useful life. This history still is important to our community. And, and the, the final slide here just shows who the three presenters were. We'll use this slide to guide uh, question and answer and uh, a broader um, wide shot of that wall was there. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen so the mayor can take questions from council. Okay, I was busy trying to read the names on the brick. Uh, all right, uh, so we'll open it up for uh, questions from uh, members of council or even I guess if some staff have questions. So uh, um, go ahead, uh, just uh, indicate your desire to speak and we'll let you speak. I could start it off, I guess. Um, uh, and it's more of a comment, uh, and this is for Nelson. Um, when you were going through the floor plan, you indicated a, um, um, an office for a planner. Um, and I think you mentioned one day a week, and I believe the planner's here four days a week now. Just and starting March 1st. As, uh, as of March 1st, uh, that, that uh, took off. So we, you could maybe correct that uh, for, uh, for tomorrow night. And uh, uh, they, you know, he does need an office, and he's here. Uh, uh, four days a week. I'll do that. Other other questions? Uh, start with Councillor Rose. <clears throat> yes, thank you. 
Um, I noticed this uh, plan is a, I'm gonna call it for lack of a better, better term, a bungalow plan, everything on one level. Um, at one time there was talk about maybe cost savings by going two level as in a full basement underneath. Um, was there a reason why that hasn't been done or is it not to code or just wondering? We did. Nelson can answer yeah, that. I can respond to that. Uh, we did uh, consider it earlier on uh, during uh, construction of the fire hall, we were getting close to having some issues mm -hmm. with uh, groundwater and the uh, soil testing shows that groundwater will be a challenge. It's not impossible, but when we start looking at that as well as elevator needs for accessibility, um, the cost savings really won't be there. And by going this route and we have the land base, we could sprawl a little bit and, uh, and keep it all on one floor. Uh, that's part of the reason why we did it. But we did look at the either a raised bungalow, if you want to call it that, like a split entrance or a full basement. We, we did uh, look at both of those uh, options earlier on. Other questions? Thank you. That was a good question, Murray, because I did ask that as well. Um, Cheryl. Um, just the question on storage, is that, do they feel that's uh, enough? Because I, it's usually never, never enough. There's never enough storage. I just don't know what the future, future plans, if there was be something that would be added on. I know you can few neighboring municipalities that have newer buildings and they're looking for storage. So that's what I'm, if it's an option that can be just, just the feedback on that. And that it, I, I'll comment quickly. Um, it's quite a bit of footage of storage, but we've been pestering Jeff to get to verify that we have enough. So we're <laughs> number of feet of file storage, uh, Nelson. And Nelson's right. We've had we've had an ongoing discussion about file storage and that file room with the rolling file uh, units with the thousand feet. We believe is uh, more than enough. And I think when you plan for file storage, figure out what you need and kind of double it. And we think we're right in that range. Uh, because it, you, you do, you run out, and, and uh, Councillor Matheson, it's a great question. And uh, I think, you know, I built a fairly new house a number of years back, too. And the first thing you find out in a really big hurry is you never have enough storage. And so we, we have contemplated that and have worked in storage. Again, uh, Cheryl, go ahead. Yeah, just another question is to, um, I guess, depending on which um, design option you go with it's still um the windows at the front in the main like on the um council chamber side is there any concern that those windows would be too big when it comes to lighting if there's ever a day presentation because i see the there'd be a screen i'm assuming behind where the council sits and then there's also the one on the side. I'm just wondering about the windows, if it's too much lighting, the natural light, if that's a concern. I guess that's a, so, is that a John question? Uh, I can start. And then I think Nelson, I think between Nelson and I, I think we can probably cover it. I mean, the one thing about this site is it has the optimum sun angle. Um, that east facing council chambers is nice because you'll get the morning sun out of the east. Um, if you, uh, in the summertime, when you get a lot of heat pick up from the building, those uh, those windows to the south won't get that direct sun because the sun angle will be more from the north. So from a sun angle perspective, this is a really optimum configuration for the building. And, um, and again, if any of you have had a chance to tour the new fire hall, if light coming in was a problem because of the time of day of a meeting, um, we put those uh, very modest but very effective blinds on the fire hall that I would anticipate we would just put those window coverings in that would allow us to darken the room for presentations. And Nelson, I think you, you've thought about sun angle as well. 
Yeah, it, it uh, I just be repeating what, uh, what you just said, Jeff. Um, as far as these exterior views, the window layouts, and even the interior layouts, I don't want to say that we're done tweaking it, but it's pretty close. And so uh, even the floor plan layout, for instance, we haven't done our final code review. So, and once we get that hammered out and which elevation seems to be attractive or chosen to move ahead, the windows may change a little bit, but not anything drastic. Um, somebody else had their hand up. Mike, go ahead. Sure. Uh, just a question about uh, the budget. Just wondered um, how accurate that is with recent tender results and that. Um, but then here now the bare bones residential is up to 285 a square foot. So I just uh, when we throw around big numbers, people get worked up. But I'd just like to make sure that we're fairly accurate on that. I believe that we're we're accurate. Um, as I had said to uh, the working committee, I just, you, you just hate to uh, put together a budget at this time, the way it seems to be so, so volatile. Um, but I believe that we're, we're comfortable with that uh, in that range of 225, like Jeff had, uh, had mentioned. I think that we would be comfortable in that range. Um, when you compare this to a house, there's not quite as much finishing and it's a little larger building. And so some of those costs uh, get buffered out through the area. Um, and I'm not sure like in, in like our kitchens, for instance, aren't going to be $50,000 kitchens and, and just that kind of thing. So I, I think we'll be good. Uh, I feel comfortable at the 225, 200 to 225. Um, if we had given you a budget on this about a year and a half ago, we probably would have told you a buck 50. Yeah. So that's, that's, you know, where we are today. And it helps with the site work. We know what's in that site, or we think we do from the soil testing and from what we ran into at the fire hall. I don't think we're in, in going to hit something that's unknown and sink us with, uh, you know, $200,000. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Um, just a question I've asked a couple times. When you, you touched on it really briefly, Nelson, when you talked about future, the ability for future development. Um, when, and I've talked a lot about it just as our municipality grows, the, the thoughts that our campus area is probably going to need future development. So when you did the plan, did you sort of not really ghost it in, but like sort of plan out how easily it would be to add to the building or to reconfigure if we needed to down the road? I haven't. I'm going to share my screen just quickly though here. Um, so, so when our first expansion for the, the office itself and, and discussion of how how we go at uh, adding more staff in here. The first go is fill the offices that aren't, aren't full, but, but there's only four. And then these two managers offices may fill earlier. There's only two pure additional ones. This plans review and storage right now, although the building department doesn't have a plans examiner, they do have a need for storage. And then that would become kind of the plans, examiner, and storage. The first spot we would expand is this community room. It would come back into office space and the community room would either go somewhere on the back of the building or somewhere else. So that's the first place we would go. And then after that, then we're looking at expansion. We can fill in this corner here and we'll probably have to blow through an office or come through mechanical space. This air conditioning unit that I show here when I was, I probably should show it out here because that's really where we're gonna put it is outside this expansion. And that was actually even brought up 
you know, by Bob uh, earlier on in discussions that we want to make sure that we have the ability to make this as one expansion. And then from there, it's really larger. So then, then it's, we've got to come out the back end and, and there's, you know, you could come out all the way to here, depending on what happens with this property, but we've got quite a bit of parking here to, for, for this uh, municipal office. So that's, that's the kind of stage part or stage expansion that we had discussed in some of the meetings. Okay. Okay. Other questions? No. Oh, sorry, Nicholas. <laughs> I, had, I had heard uh, a couple times thrown around that uh, one of the proposals would be a, a LEED certified proposal. Is that still in the consideration? Which one of you wants to answer that? I think I'll let Nelson. Uh, we haven't. Uh, looked at this as being a Leeds uh, project, our own selves. Um, if we were going to do this as a Leeds project, consulting fees would extend, it would increase uh, a fair bit because of the documentation that has to be chased with the Leeds program. And me and, well, myself, anyhow, I'm not sure about John, but I do not have good background with Leeds and I'm, almost certain that it would increase the cost of the building beyond what we're talking about right now. Will it be energy efficient? Absolutely. Do we want to use uh, local product where we can use local product? Absolutely. Um, but that's not so much for Leeds resonation or getting the Leeds uh, designation as it is to support local as best you can. And, uh, and it's just better for, uh, for warranty issues, for any other building issues you may, might have in the future. But we haven't looked at this as a Leeds project our own selves, no. And, and if I may, Walter, would, would there be one proposal that would be better suited for solar panels uh, on it versus another one? All, all three, of the, all four of those roofs will have room for solar panels on the one side. And if I bring that up very quick for you, uh, if I share it, I can probably show it fairly quickly. It doesn't matter which option. Um, this area here is our main roof and easily designed for uh, solar panels. This roof here is a clear span truss roof over this area. And it's not as nice to, to design for solar panels, but we can easily take this section. Any other questions, Nicholas? Can I just add a bit oh, about sorry. leads? Um, if, uh, if, if you will, I, I'm on lead um, and uh, had some experience with lead with the design and uh, implementation of a lead platinum building. And it, it certainly took a it was a much higher design cost as, as Nelson indicated. And I believe that the fundamental choice you need to make um, lead, the lead silver and lead gold uh, areas or levels would be, and I should say lead, lead is leadership and energy and environmental design. And the, 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 the functions that you wanna achieve are energy efficiency, light, air handling, which are all the things you've heard us talking about. So you you know, I, I think the philosophy here is that we've driven the project with those principles in mind, um, but that we don't see the value in uh, doing lead silver or lead gold. If you're going to do lead and you want your building to be an example that people will come from far and near and far to to see as an example, you'd want to do lead platinum. So for lead silver and gold, I think we can achieve it the principles of sight lines, natural light and things um, just through our design choices rather than actually getting the certification is my opinion. Okay, uh, Councilor Marshall had a question about uh, Yeah, I just question about the uh, the actual council chambers with the, um, um, you know, I, I understand we need the space for when we have that large, that one-off large meeting 
um, but it seems like an extremely large space for most of our council meetings. I'm just, um, you know, sound and uh, just looking empty. I wonder if there's a chance to, you know, if there's even an opportunity to put a curtain in or something in there to even split it off. It might make it more usable and a little less cavernous. So, um, so the design that we're proposing there with the way that we set up the front and the projection, we think sound will be manageable and uh, I don't have the exact actual, the actual feet. Nelson would have to just check the plan for the feet and I don't have the plan open. It's not that gigantic of space. However, um, the concept with the council chamber space is that it's a flex space so that while we would anticipate leaving it set up between council meetings for um, the council set up, we certainly could use that space for other uses between council meetings. Those aren't fixed chairs and that wouldn't be dedicated to strictly council use. And just, you know, with Darcy and myself and Nelson and the conversations of the working group, when we think back through the kinds of events that the municipality could host, we could see ourselves using that space on a fairly regular basis for something other than a council meeting. And so we think the sound can be managed by design and having that space would save us that worry that we have on a regular basis about how many people are gonna show up for the uh, consideration meetings we have on a given night. And, um, and so that's where the size came from. My, my real question is, is, is there an opportunity to put another, um, you know, another partition or curtain that still could be closed off you know, a third of it could be, um, you know, since you have the, the where you're showing the, the the table, and you've got you know a third of that next or half the next room, and then you've got that other build or other space that could be you know, even used for something else during a council meeting. It just keeps it from appearing quite so uh, cavernous, I guess, when the meeting's on and being empty. I assume this is a another or a is this a like a cur curtain or a closed room right kind of where that podium shows. Is that what that's showing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that would give us the ability, uh, Councillor Marshall, at the at the front to kind of, if we chose to use the flex space for some other use, that the way the council desk and table is managed at this point in time is we use our council for a lot of meetings because we do, and we have councillors' desks with drawers that they keep their budgets and their and their other information in, and. Um, we would anticipate that if we did use this for a more public type of activity, that flex space, that we'd want to pull that wall and provide that sort of security for the front council space, um, but be able to quickly open it up again for a council meeting the next day or whatever. It's kind of like using your your uh, arena for ice hockey and then the next day a basketball game. I mean, I think this is where we'll be judged if we can maximize the use of space. And um, whether or not we could divide it into smaller increments, I'm not sure. That's a roof design. I think we were looking at a fairly open, like not a full cathedral, but a partial cathedral to give that council chambers a really nice airy look. And it does get you in trouble for another wall across it. Um, and Nelson would have to comment on that. Yeah, it's uh, if we put a wall back here somewhere and try to split it into three, we got to watch some of the exiting requirements. Um, it's not impossible, but you can see where we've jutted this out so that we can take this uh, bifold and, and, and put it in recess. So we'd have to do something like that over here as well. Uh, I'm not sure if it'd be a lot of advantage unless you're actually going to use the space. I think once we're done with the ceiling uh, modifications, whatever we're going to do with the ceiling, uh, whether it's cathedral, whether it's punch down areas or, or how we're going to dress up the ceiling space, um, the sound transmission I think will be pretty good. Uh, that's, that's, key, that, that's key in this council chambers to, to make sure that noise or, and sound Number one, noise doesn't overtake it. So if, if people are rumbling around here, it doesn't make this so loud, you can't even hear yourself think. But but that sound travels when you're speaking. And those those are two different sounds. And But I mean, you will have mics, you will have um, some audio and visual uh, around in this room. And I think you'll be set up pretty good. 
but the only reason I can think of for dividing this off is if you thought you would use that this space and you would only ever open this up to uh, for a big council chamber or council meeting. And if, if that was a need, then we're going to have to relook at this a little bit because we got to watch exiting in and out of that space without going through another space necessarily. Okay, so I'll move on to other other questions. These are all good questions, by the way, and, and uh, I do want to mention that uh, uh, kind of the reason that we're meeting here tonight was because uh, Dean thought we should have a, a dry run at it uh, for all of council before uh, <laughs> before we hit the road with the uh, with the show tomorrow night. So I think it was a good suggestion from Dean, and I think uh, you know the questions you're answering are obviously going to be questions that uh, uh, ratepayers will have. Oh, sorry. Okay, I got it. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Oh, John wants to say something. Okay, I got oh. John later on. So. Yeah. So, sorry, guys, I had my muted myself. Um, the thing about the council chambers is the, the part that's over the big U-shaped one. Uh, Nelson, can you bring the floor plan up again? Thank you. The, the, the area above the big U-shaped council chambers, that, uh, that ceiling will be a flat lower ceiling, not real low, but, but it will be flat. Whereas the ceiling over the multi-use space will be a much higher ceiling. So that for smaller council meetings on a regular, more regular basis, the, the room, uh, if it's closed off, over the council chambers um, should function quite nicely um, for a, a smaller or more regular council chambers. Um, and the other thing I'd like to go back to is, uh, I think it's Cheryl Matheson's question about glass and window size in the multi-use space in the council chambers. The other thing that we can look at is, is the types of glass used. Uh, the, Glass technology nowadays is phenomenal. Um, and we can have a look at um, some glass that, that would reflect a lot of light and not let a lot of light directly into the room. So there's, there's several options we can look at there. Thank okay. you. And, and uh, that's not the first time that there's been a question about the windows, is it, John? That's true. <laughs> And maybe not the last either. <laughs> uh, other questions? Any um, comments from, uh, from uh, uh, Bob McLean or anybody else that wants any of the staff, Darcy, any of the staff people that have been on the committee, anything they'd like to add at this time? I'd like to ask Darcy to just give an update on registration for the... Yes. Uh, open houses, if you would, see if you've had a chance to pull the numbers to see what the most current is. I'm putting you on the spot, Carla. No, that's okay. I did pull the numbers at the start of the meeting and it was 12 for the first session, 11 for the second session and eight for the third. But I was just gonna check right now real quick to get the, uh, the latest to see if there's any changes as of tonight. And it's just loading right now on my screen, but- I'll just- um, uh, the third one that Darcy's referring to is the virtual session on Wednesday night. And then just as it's up for council, we'll send you a logistics email about uh, the names of who intends to uh, participate in the five o'clock session tomorrow afternoon and who just which of you would like to participate in seven. And we certainly would really appreciate if you could, appre could participate in both public in-person sessions and also the virtual in order to hear all the feedback but we realized that would be four meetings this week and, um, and we get it if that's more than you can do. And um, so, and then what we'll, we anticipate doing is that session that we do on Wednesday evening, we will, that virtual session, we will 
uh, collect it with YouTube. We will post it Thursday morning and um, we will ask for and we'll put it out there and promote it as an opportunity for the public if you miss the open house sessions to see it and provide us with feedback uh, through a survey tool over the over the long weekend. And in all cases, um, we, we envision obtaining input from the public sessions, from the virtual session, and from the um, uh, uh, follow-up sessions that we post. We, we, we're looking for input and we're looking for votes on design, which council has to choose, but just knowing what the different uh, groups thought would be information we could provide you with on uh, Tuesday before our council meeting Tuesday night. So yeah, to, to date, to right now, it is 12 for the first session, 11 for the second session, and then eight have registered for the virtual session. Okay, yeah. thanks, Dan. Uh, Nicholas, go ahead. What might be some timelines that we have to uh, aim for coming up in the future? Great question. So um, to keep the design going, and so we, and, and I want to first of all give you the status of the grants. I mean, the grant application, um, we got this, it's, it's a bit frustrating at times dealing with different levels of government. The grant application window was announced on November 16th. We had to have had a plan and then a council meeting and uh, our application had to be in by the 21st of December. And that was a hard stop, although some kinds of applications got extended, but we were in, so there was no extension. Um, the key thing with that grant application was that we had to commit to being ready to get in break ground by September and be substantially complete by uh, the end of the year of 2021. We were in our consultations with MMAH on the grant opportunity. We were, they were pretty clear that they were going to be a hard deadline for the break ground date. The work had to be started by date if you weren't doing a building, but that the end date was likely going to be something that uh, might have to move. But of course, here we sit, um, you know, three months after we submitted it, greater than three months after we submitted it, and we haven't, other than getting an acknowledgement that they received the grant, we don't have anything more. So um, if we're going to meet the, the ground for September, I think we'd like to, if the approval process of council has seen enough information and has enough information and could choose um, a concept like a, a, a face, one of the face patterns, we could move into detailed design and we can bring that report on Tuesday night for council consideration. Um, and we would bring it with a recommendation that we should move forward so we can get on to detailed design and we have a chance of beating the grant deadlines. Um, there's a detailed Q&A that's now on the website, which answers a lot of these questions about, you know, what happens if we don't get the grant? Is the grant assured? Um, there's a number of those kinds of question and answers been posted on the project website to help the public counselors of what these options are. So, um, as staff will be coming with a report on April 6th, encourage you to move to the next step. And of course, if council on the basis of what you heard tonight and what you hear the next two nights is comfortable or not comfortable, it's a council decision. Okay, um, Bob McLean is still on here. I don't know whether he has anything further to comment on at all. Bob? Uh, I have nothing to wish to add to the conversation, Your Worship. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, oh, Councillor Harrell, sorry. Yes, um, could we get a comment on um, what the estimated cost differences are for the different profile options? Question, and uh, Nelson can answer that one quite easily. <laughs> yeah, the uh, in, in truth, all all four options <clears throat> are going to be similar in cost, especially when I'm talking a budget of 200 to $225 per square foot. Um, the last option will be a little more money potentially, but again, I would say for 
for decision making purposes, they're all the same price. And uh, Mike Tam can zoom in on this one because uh, uh, this has come up at our meetings a couple of times. If we decided to build the building all out of steel, the price. It, it, it doesn't make a lot of difference because in the end, if we do it out of steel siding, the steel siding will not be <clears throat> your barn steel. It's going to be a, a, a profile steel that's going to be almost as much as a masonry veneer. Um, and steel right now has, has exploded in cost. Concrete has, is fairly stable in cost. So I would hazard a guess that you might be paying more for some sightings than you will masonry. Yeah. I had to ask that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any other uh, any other questions? Um, um, I'm also oh Murray, go ahead. Thank you. Yes um, I was wondering if anybody on the building committee if they had any input or um, any concerns that they wanted to voice at this time. Okay, um, looking at the building committee. Uh, Dean, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you to Councillor Rose for the question. Um, I guess my only concern at this time uh, would be the financing. Um, there was a couple slides laid out on the financing. Um, I would probably defer discussing the financing until we've had a chance to listen to what the public has to say through the open house, uh, open house presentations that are coming up. But um, I do want to talk about the financing, but I want to wait until everyone's had a chance to absorb this first before we have that discussion afterwards. Okay. Um, anybody else that was on the working group? Uh, any comments? Doug? I don't, I don't have a lot of comments. I think we went through the four meetings to kind of get to where we were comfortable to present to you, um, to, to give you the, the options and what they need. Um, the picture I drew, uh, Nelson was right on taking it on the piece of graph paper. So I drew a two story one, Murray, just so you know, too. Um, but I think we, we set it kind of what we needed. And um, I think presented it to you. I think we've, we've kind of gone through our four meetings about the windows. Enough said. Uh, Councillor Harold, any anything further to add? I don't think I have anything further to add. Like like Doug and everyone has said, you know, we we've, we've spent some time on this um, to be prepared for for tonight and the following nights. So I think we're ready to go. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I got everybody that was on the building group. Um, so that's just a just a comment out to anybody on council, maybe more so the people that weren't on the working group. Uh, any any comments or anything as we proceed from this meeting to our public meeting tomorrow night that uh, should be tweaked or that uh, should be addressed or not mentioned? Uh, any, any type of beneficial comments there, uh, Nicholas? You're muted, Nicholas. Thank you, Walter. The only one that I would make is uh, on YouTube, when, since you guys are all in the same room and Jeff is doing the talking, it looks like, uh, it, so Jeff does the talking, but then we see your video, Walter. So maybe just switch that around for the, um, the, count, the, the, the Zoom open house is when Jeff is talking that he actually pops up on the screen rather than we see, we see Walter and Jeff's voice. Okay, so okay, you don't see Jeff. Okay. Yeah, it's, no, no. it's running through your computer, oh, okay. so we can All run right. it using the other. We'll run it using the other method. Right. Okay. And that's yeah. a great suggestion. Yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. We wouldn't yeah. have caught that from our end. Yes, good. Thank you, um, Jeff Marshall. 
the the one thing we haven't spoken about, asked any questions about it at all tonight, and I would expect we'll have some kind of uh, questions about it during the uh, uh, with the public uh, public is the uh, future of um, the existing building in that that space there. So I'm actually that's a great question, and we didn't um, you know we talked about this at length with the working group, and it's something I never I neglected to put in the uh, presentation. So the one slide Nelson included with the site plan showed how we could identify this space of the current building as a discrete uh, parcel that could be um, that could be severed off and sold and allow someone to decide what they want to do with it with, with the future. And I think that we see that as a possibility. We see a possibility that the municipality uh, holds on to the parcel of land and to, to, to find out more what our needs for the future might be. Um, we really see that as a separate project because we want to stay in the building until the uh, new building would be built because there's a lot of disruption of having to move and you would never do it. We've got a space to be in and we want to be there, move, and then begin the decision-making process about this building. We didn't include any financing revenue from this building consciously because, uh, frankly, the municipality may choose that it wants to hold it. Um, but that's a decision that we've set the design of the site up, that the options are there. The, the one thing I didn't mention <clears throat> in my discussions, the existing fire hall, a portion of it will have to go as part of this project because it will be, it, I, would, I would think that we're going to have to tear it down to somewhere around here and then board it off because it will be impacting work around this building here, around the, the proposed building. Yeah. The part that we're talking about, uh, I believe, is, is the museum part, right? Yeah, well, at, at minimum, the museum part has to go. Yeah. yeah, and we may have to go the rest of the way, depending on the detailed design. And, um, and certainly, one thing to consider, and, you know, we've got, we've got some information about this existing building. And one, of the, one of the nuances of the existing building is at the back of Fire Hall, there is like a cistern that is, uh, um, and it's been, it was filled at one point in time with broken cinder block. And um, we've done some environment, we've done preliminary environmental work in this building because in order to know what the potential options for it in the future, we did a phase one environmental. And the only thing from holding us and getting a clean phase one environmental for this building is the confirmation what's in those cisterns. And so if we did decide to demolish the fire hall and uh, open the slab that is uh, above those cisterns, we could then clean them out and get that clean phase one environmental. And it would just probably give us some real insight about what our next steps for the building might be. Because if we have any contemplation that we would want to uh, let it be sold, we'd want to be able to let it be used for residential as well as institutional, because it likely has more of a residential demand in this neighborhood than institutional. Um, and in that case, you'd want to have that environmental finished and you'd want to open that up and know what was in those cisterns. So those are the kinds of decisions that it is a bit of a complex um, set of choices that we have and we'd want to go through those systematically so that we maximize our options for the building. But again, we haven't presupposed any thing in the design of the new one. We'll let that, those decisions come as the second phase. Okay. All right. Any, oh, sorry, Dean, go ahead. I guess further to uh, what Nelson mentioned about the uh, cost of the partial dismantling of the existing fire hall building, there is also going to be a cost of providing a temporary power service to the existing admin building while the, uh, the new campus building would be uh, constructed, if I remember our discussions correctly. That's correct, yes. <clears throat> but I just wanted to make, make everyone else aware of that um, detail as well. Okay. 
Anything else? We're kind of watching the time here and seeing how this presentation would go with uh, in regards to tomorrow night. So we've been about an hour and a half. So um, that would probably uh, probably work out okay. Uh, if there is no other questions, and this is your last chance, then uh, I do want to thank you for spending your Monday night with us and uh, running through this. Um, if there is no further questions, then a motion to adjourn at uh, 836 would be in order. And moved by Councilor Rose and seconded by... Oh, and uh, Councilor Murray. Thank you. All those in favor? That is carried. And I don't know if, if, if uh, yeah, I'll wait until we're off, but I do have a question for John. 